Hi there, guys. I'm Chris Bowden, and welcome to the Geek Group. This is Vicki Campbell, Hi. future girl in the forums. And today, we're doing an equipment autopsy on an antique. It's kind of cool. We have this old Hewlett Packard audio signal generator that we've had forever, and it finally died. And it's kind of cool because it's, it's like 60s vintage technology. So I figured this would be a fun one to make a video out of. So what does it do? It makes audio signals. For what purpose? Um, we use it for dancing goop. It's, uh, if you look at the front, uh -huh. it's, uh, it basically it's the lowest tech iPod you can get. It, makes a, it outputs a sine wave, and this sets your frequency from zero, like down there is uh, this set. Oh, no, that's impedance over here, is your multiplier. So right now we'd be making a 20 hertz tone, 20 cycles per second. And then there would be 200, and there would be 2,000. Okay. So, yeah. Um, this is the main on and off. This is switching the load in and out. And what, what is that? Wait a second. What's that? The, this is your output side. Oh, okay. Like here. Um, all right. Down here is your input decibels, and you can put an input on here. Without it, it just makes a, a sine wave. And then this sets your frequency. This is coarse adjust. This is fine adjust. These two set how loud it goes out. Okay, this is decibels, mm -hmm. and this is decibels, and this is in hundreds, and this is in tens. This is your output impedance. So it's an electronics term for matching the load, and we'll do a whole video on impedance matching, but that's pretty much outside of the scope of this one. I, I just want to stick to taking this apart and the basic. This is more on identifying different parts and what they do and how they work. Okay. Um, but these are just basic switches. Most all the stuff on the front is a switch of some form. These are switches here and there's switches down here and this is cool because this is old school like they don't make them like this anymore this is done with point-to-point -point wiring there's no circuit boards in here and you don't see a lot of that anymore I mean, outside of the really high-end amplifiers nobody does it anymore so um, so let's open it up inside there's a, <coughs> Wait a, a second. shielded what? What? why would it why would a really high-end amplifier want to do a point-to-point -point wiring system because audio no files are stupid and they'll pay for it. Oh, okay. I mean, these are the people that spend twenty thousand dollars for a nine-watt tube amplifier. Okay. So, not all audiophiles are stupid, but if you want to find a group of crazy, crazy people, get into the audiophile world. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the so monster uh, company that you know, Monster Cables, has right. built a whole industry on stupid people. It's great. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. If you're one of those guys out there with like a three hundred dollar power cord that really is nothing but a power cord, yeah, I'm making fun of you right now. So let's look in here. We've got a cover, and I've done some pre-disassembly. I took some bolts out to make this go a little easier. And this is just a shield, and we don't need that. But the cool thing is this. Now this is the main frequency knob up front. And it comes through. I don't know if we're going to be able to see that. Here, I'll turn it around so you guys can see. There's the linkage that comes in from the front. And this is a stop that keeps you from turning it too far. And then there's this, which is an alignment fixer, basically. It allows these two different shafts to be a little bit out of alignment and everything still work. There's some very nice brass gears in here, and that just reduces it down. So you can see you move a lot of this out here to get a little motion in there. Right. And there's a gear reduction built into the front because if I just, if I turn the big wheel. Oh, wow. Now here, I'll, I'll show on the front so you can see what I'm doing. When I turn the big wheel here, the little wheel moves a lot, okay? And it's moving way faster than I'm moving. And there's a gearbox in here. And, and these things inside move too. And these things inside move. We're going to talk about the things inside because okay. those things are really cool. So let's let's get a good look down in there, and you can see them there. Can this, I move the bar? Yeah, move the bar. Move the bar. This is a capacitor. It is an air capacitor, and it is a variable capacitor. So they're usually referred to as an air variable capacitor because engineers, yeah, they're cool like that. So what we have is there's a set of plates here. And these are the rotors. These move. And they mesh down inside another set of plates that are down. I'll move this all the way out. You can see the other plates down here. And these are the stators. And they don't move. And the important thing is, these never touch these. And these are electrically connected to each other. 
but they're insulated from these. So these don't touch these and they don't make an electrical connection. These, all the stators, are electrically connected to each other. And so you've got two sets of plates. And, and we've talked about capacitors a lot in the past where, here's our, our other capacitor, there's two sets of plates. You've got this side stack of plates over here, and you've got this side stack of plates over here, and they're interwoven with an insulator in between them. We call that a dielectric. So here you've got copper plates and copper plates with a plastic dielectric, and over on this, you've got metal plates and metal plates with air as the dielectric. And as you move them in and out, the value of the capacitor changes. Now, a capacitor is like a, a battery. We've done a lot of videos about capacitors, so I will just, we'll just cover the basics of that. A capacitor is like a battery where it charges and discharges very, very, very quickly. And this capacitor is charging, and the, the more the capacitors are together, the lower the frequency of that oscillator circuit. Because it's just an oscillator. I mean, this whole thing is pretty much just a very precise variable oscillator. And these control the frequency by controlling the value of the capacitor. Um, anybody who is doing basic, basic electronics, one of the first circuits you'll build probably is an RC tank circuit or some kind of oscillator. And you'll learn about how by varying a capacitance in the circuit, you can vary the frequency of the circuit. And we should do that. We should do, have Kid Welcome down and do a basic electronics thing and we'll build an oscillator. That, that, that would be, cool. be fun. So that's that. And there's another little capacitor in here, which, oh no, yeah, you can see it there, right there. This is one that you adjust with a screwdriver. And if I turn this, you'll see the plates move. And that is a trimming capacitor for calibrating the machine. So when you want to tweak everything and, and get it set perfectly, you grab an oscilloscope and a screwdriver, and you can get everything set just right. So that's, that's the heart of it, is that big capacitor. Now, there's this thing, which is a big transformer. And it really sucks, because I can't really get into that transformer. It's a sealed box. And you see these in older equipment. You don't see them so much anymore. But it's just these are all the terminals in the transformer. And then there's a the center one. And the values on it are known to Hewlett Packard and probably nobody else in the world. It was probably a specific thing. But HP and General Electric does that with these a lot, where it's a transformer made for this. It is probably. Um, the main transformer for all the various voltages. These two big ones over here are probably the filament transformers. Because we have filament transformers in here, because we have Filaments. thermionic emission. We have tubes. And here, I'll wipe this off, because we've got vacuum tubes here. And that's just cool. I am. Um, Is this still good? Probably. I mean, it's, it's certainly got a few years on it, but I'd be surprised if the tubes are all dead. I do not have a vacuum tube tester. This tube's kind of wonky. The, the base is well, it's falling. Oh, that's OK. Is it? Yeah, that's okay. a, a lot of tubes will have a silvery deposit on the inside. And uh, we'll do a whole segment on vacuum tubes. If, if Mikey zooms in here and gets us a really close shot on that, right there you can see there's a, a silvery reflective part on the outside of the tube. And the reason for that is inside the tube, and you and I can see it. I don't know if the guys at home can see it. But if you look inside, there is a little bar that goes across on the back. Oh, yeah. That's the getter. And when they, it gets. It, it gets. It's as part of the manufacturing process of the tube, they put a getter in there. And they burn. They pump all the air out. Yeah. And then they burn off any schmutz left inside. And it deposits on the side of the tube. And that's what a getter does. So, oh. yeah. So there's a tube there. And that's a nice, pretty glass one. Um, and we've got. There's a lot of tubes in here, but most of them are sealed, so you can't really see inside. Should they just pull out? They should. Just usually. a rubber they gasket? Just, well, it's not even a rubber gasket. It's just a socket. Here's a tube. This one, for those following at home, because there's going to be some old guy that writes and be like, oh, hey, that's a, a triode or pentode or something, a mercury vapor rectifier tube. Um, and I don't know what the, these all are. I, I know the very basics of vacuum tubes. But if you look at this one, um, usually if you read them, there will be a number on them that tells you what it is. There is not on this one. It just says RCA. Um, and you can see on top there's the silvery part. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got it. This is a 6SN7. And that number will tell you exactly what this is. I have no idea what it is. The other one, 
for those following at home who want to know, it's got 5109 down on the side. And it, this is a uh, 5U4G. And that means something to somebody who wants to look them up. And you guys can Google it, I'm sure. Um, now we've got, this is an interesting tube. This tube here, let's see if I can get you a shot of it. Right. Where are we? OK. This tube right here has a little wire coming out the top. So I'm going to take that wire off. And that wire, by the way, goes into the rotor contact on our big variable capacitor. And it is this tube, which is a 6J7. And it's really cool, but you can't really see anything because it's, it's all sealed in there. But there's, there's a little tube. And there's lots of tubes. And we've got this. This is a uh, 6L6, which is a pretty common tube. And often found in pairs. There's two 6L6s. And uh, in fact, those are 6L6Gs. They're labeled down in here. Like this is 6SF5. So if I look on here, 6SF5, so it tells me that tube goes in there. And there's two of those. So I've got two, two pairs of tubes. And usually, if you don't know at all what you're doing, like me, it's very common that you'll see them like that. And that tells you this is probably an amplifier stage down here. Vacuum tubes are used a lot in amplifiers. In fact, vacuum tubes are used in all of the best amplifiers. Why? I like tube amps. Why? They're just cool. No, but why would you use a vacuum tube as an amplifier? Like what? I don't know. You understand. really want to know? I really okay. do want to know. Um, I don't know anything about this. OK, this we're going like to go to the board. It's a world for me. We're going to go to the board. I'm going to start a holy war with this. So please watch the entire video before you start commenting and ah. telling me the many ways in which I'm wrong. And I'm a godless heathen for even saying things like this. OK. Now. There is a lot of people who say that tube amplifiers are better than solid state. Okay, now solid state is where we're dealing with like transistors and stuff. Okay? okay. Now here's the big difference. It all boils down to this. Tube amplifiers. Every, let's say we're doing the, the simplest of things, a sine wave. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now you have zero here. Yeah. And you have the maximum capacity of the amplifier, which we'll say is here. Okay. Now the distance from there to there is the headroom. It's how loud your amplifier can go, how much you can amplify. Okay. Okay. Simple. Now, if you have a vacuum tube, here's how tube amps work. We're gonna we're just going to the very basic. We're gonna ignore the power supplies and all that stuff. But here's how a tube amplifier works. You have a filament down here and it's and you have your grid and you have your plate okay and all of this is inside our vacuum tube of science okay okay now your filament you put um, a, a low voltage on a low voltage signal let's say this is 10 volts okay and the filament shoots out electrons and and they're all shooting this way they will go away. It's called thermionic emission. It's how vacuum tubes work. Now on here, you have your input signal, like from your guitar. And let's say that's 0 to 3 volts, OK? And that goes here. Now all these electrons are going at this grid. And if there's 0 volts on here, most of the electrons stop at the grid. And only a few go through. And, and they come out this way. Now, when this is at 3 volts, a whole lot more of these electrons come through, and they, they go right through the grid, and the grid helps them along, so you get a whole lot of electrons out here, right? So this is like a valve. In fact, a common term for vacuum tubes is a valve, or an electron valve. So out here, let's say you get 0 to 100 volts. So you can use a little tiny voltage to control a very big voltage in real time. And it, it acts like a valve. Now, you can also do this. Now, look at the symbols involved there, OK? Because that's pretty much what they really look like. I mean, if you, if you pick up a vacuum tube, you can see there's grids and plates, and, and it's pretty simple. Now, this is analog. 
This is glass. These things wear out, they break, they make a lot of heat, they, they, they're, they're incandescent. I mean, these glow in operation. Yes. Okay, so this is old school, valve technology. Now, modern day. Looks kind of the same. We've got a little circle, you know, we are circle. We got three wires going into it, and there's three things. There's the, the, the um, cathode down here, and we've got the grid and the, the screen and all that, right? It's very similar. The difference is this is a transistor. And you have a base, an emitter, and a collector. Okay, so we've got our, base, our, our collector, a base, and an emitter here. Okay, this emits, yep. this collects, and this gets called the base because I don't have any clue, but we'll just call it the base. base and this works the same way. Okay. You, use, you, you have your input at a constant, you have your output, which varies with a big variable, and you have a little thing that varies a little bit, and you can use a little signal contr to control a big signal. Oh. And it's, it's how a relay works, except a relay just does it on or off. These vary infinitely in between. This is a transistor. And we can make these now, I mean, ones used in like amplifiers, or amplifiers and that are about the size of a quarter, but I mean, you can fit 500 quadrillion, billion, million, and four on like the head of a pin, and that's how, you know, computer processors work. It's insane now, you know, even knows the numbers anymore. But that's, that's the difference, okay? But the difference is how these, in, in theory, they both work pretty much the same, okay? But then you go into the real world. Everything's fine until you cross this line. As long as you stay in the headroom, everything's fine. It's cool. But then we get into clipping. Now, if your amplifier tries to make a signal this big, it's going to clip. It's going to cut this off. Okay? So you're only going to get that. So the output waveform is going to look Like that. Okay, right. it's going to be hard cut. That's clipping. This is what happens when you drive an amplifier beyond what it's capable of. And they did this in the '60s with the guitar, and Jimi Hendrix made a whole career on it. It's, it's when it's you the get this fuzzy, distortion. Yeah, it's distortion. It's the yeah. fuzzy, noisy. It's it's bad. It's doing it wrong, and it sounds good. Hmm. Okay. The distortion you get is different. The, the way that the amplifier clips is different with vacuum tubes than it is with these. If you overdrive an amplifier with vacuum tubes, it makes a pleasing, warm, fuzzy distortion. If you overdrive an amplifier with transistors, it makes a much harder, harsher, more accurate distortion. And it gets even worse when you take the next jump and go from this to zeros and ones. When you get into digital audio, it's a brick wall. There, there is no soft knee distortion. The, the break, because it doesn't make a perfect clip. It's, it's a knee. It's, it's a, a slight bend. So it'll look like that. The shape of this knee dictates how pleasing the distortion is. And it changes from there to there to there. And the distortion gets progressively worse as you get progressively better because the music has gotten more accurate. The amplifiers have gotten more accurate. The ability to reproduce the music has gotten more accurate. So this is where you get the holy war because this system is better than this system is better than this system as far as reproducing the accuracy of the original input signal. This amplifier is more accurate to the original sound than this amplifier. You cannot argue this. This is gospel. It's just how it is. It's, we're better at this now. But when you overdrive it, this amplifier sounds better than this one. That's the trade-off. So both sides are right, but when you take it purely subjective and people start using words like airier, it's, it's got a more airy sound to it. Shut up. Give me numbers. Don't, it sounds, it's a crisper, cleaner sound. Shut up! You're wrong. You know you're wrong, and I know you're wrong, and everybody knows you're wrong, and the only way you're ever going to get proven on this, and people have done this a hundred times, they, they do what's called an ABX test, uh -huh. which is the holy grail of science, the ABX test, okay? 
You take two amplifiers, and you have a tube amplifier, and you have a solid state amplifier. And you get really good ones. You get like Mark Levinson's, okay, mm. which is like the best amplifiers that money can buy. Okay. And that's why Mark Levinson should send me some nice amplifiers. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm shilling your amps, man. <laughs> Send us a, Mark Levinson amplifiers cost more than your car and my car put together. In fact, you can buy Mark, Mark Levinson amplifiers that cost more than my house. Hmm. Yes. But you take like a Mark Levinson solid state amplifier, and you take the, the I don't even know who, but you take the greatest tube amplifier you can ever invent, okay? Hmm. And you put them through the exact same pair of speakers, use the same wires, use the same input source, everything's the same. Yes and you put them both in a box, and all you have is some switches that say A and B, mm -hmm. right? And the guy who made the box, you send him home. Right. You get another person who's never seen inside the box, doesn't know which is which amp, mm -hmm. and you have them flip the switch. Right. So they don't know, and they're right. the tester. Yes. And then you have a guy come in and listen, yeah. and see if he can tell. Right, it's a double blind. Yeah, it's a double blind test. It's cool. an ABX test. Nobody ever passes. It just doesn't happen. They because can't tell which one is which. No. I mean, there's, there's things that you can tell. Like, you can take any professional audio guy, put him in a room, and he can tell you different input sources. I can tell you an MP3 from a WAV file. I can tell you a, a turntable from a cassette deck. I can tell you a reel-to-reel -reel from a cassette deck. I, you know, anything like that, that's easy, because they each have specific characteristics. But with basic technology stuff, like tube amps versus solid state, you can't tell. As so long as it isn't driven in distortion, you can't tell. The minute it goes in distortion, oh yeah, you can tell. Especially with digital versus analog, it's night and day because digital distortion is a brick wall. Um, and digital distortion sounds really bad. Mm. Really, 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 really bad. As you can tell from a lot of our earlier videos, because we don't have a sound guy. <laughs> well, we do have a sound guy, but our sound guy is our camera guy who doesn't get to do any sound. So. Mikey is a professional sound guy, though, and we're just going to be nice and not talk about the sound quality in some of our earlier videos. <laughs> You just got the pair of Yeah, yeah, you, and they're pink. We should do a video on your pink IEMs one of these days. Yeah. All right, we've got this little tiny tube, which is a JRC 6H6 VT90. I have absolutely no idea what it is, but it's cute. It is cute. It is cute. You can have this. Aww. It's got some mouse poo on top, too. Oh, That's thank there. you. Yeah. Well, I'll wash it. All right, now, this is a cool thing. Let's look down in the bottom, because we've covered the top. It's pretty much tubes and transformers, mm -hmm. and this is... This is the component side, right? But this is neat. If you look, th this is what you don't get to see anymore. Nobody builds them like this. Because it costs a fortune to build them like this. But look, look in there. Just look at that. That is point-to-point -point wiring. It's grossly inefficient. Quality control is a nightmare. But it's pretty. This is art. This was, this was somebody put these components in here by hand. <laughs> and it's neat because you can cut stuff out and say, well, I know what this is. Because nowadays, with modern surface mount technology, things are so tiny you can't even touch them. But, I mean, you pull that out and hold that hand. There's a resistor. And you can pick it up and you can hold it in your hand. You know that's a resistor. And, and the cool thing is if this breaks, you can fix it. Because you can get another because, resistor yeah, you and can, you can, you can see can it. You can go on, like, Mauser or go to Radio Shack or whatever and buy that resistor. And you can walk into the store and say, I need this. And the guy can say, OK, well, here, let's get our colors. And, and it's, it's green, blue, orange, and silver. And right now, there's like eight people at home who just went, oh, I know exactly what that is. Do you know off the top of your head? What uh, colors? It's green, blue, orange, and silver. And it appears to be about a 5 watt resistor. By, I'm just going by size. Silver? Yeah. Fifty-six four zeros plus or minus ten percent. Yeah. Okay. I have no idea if you're right now. I know, I've um, I had it memorized when I was a kid, but I haven't done it in years. Uh, black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, gray, white. Violet goes willingly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now, everybody watching just over the age of thirty is doing the mnemonic in their head, and they're trying to make sure they don't do it with the wrong people in the room because it's really impolite. There, there is a mnemonic to this, but I don't know the new politically correct one, and I'm really not going to say the old one because the hate mail will be insane. But yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. But there's, there's stuff in here. I mean, these are big resistors. Um, we've got capacitors here. 
old school sprags here. Let's let's cut a couple things out here. I'm just gonna flip this right over. Ah. I'll move it forward just a little bit. Are we out? Are we out of the range? There. There you go. Okay. Now look, we've got some capacitors here, and these are neat. Now the capacitors, you don't need color bands because you can just look at it and go, oh, well that's a uh, 600 volt DC. It's a uh, one mic plus or minus 10%. So it's a one microfarad 600 volt capacitor. The voltages and stuff in this age are a lot higher than modern day stuff. Like if this is a modern day thing, everything in there would be like five volts, 12 volts, nine volts, really mm -hmm. low voltage stuff. So a lot of things in here will run at like three, 400 volts easy. Um, we've got three big capacitors here. We've got a fuse socket on the back. Wouldn't it suck take this whole thing apart and find out that the fuse is blown and that was Know why we finally retired it. Yeah, we'll take the fuse out and see. It is. The fuse is blown. <laughs> the fuse is indeed blown. Yeah. See, that could have been what finally killed it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know what this is. This is something I've never seen before. But it's neat. What is this thing? It says mica mold, and it has an arrow on it, so maybe it's a diode, but it's got three colored dots. It's got an orange, black, and white dot. There's spaces for six dots. Mike, get a really good close-up on that. Oh, that's what I got. Oh, you got a good close-up on it while I was looking? I have no idea what that is, but if you know, please comment in. It might be a capacitor. It might be a diode. I, I have no idea. It's neat. Um, We've got some really big caps. Now, a common thing, uh, especially in older gear like this, one of the common failure modes over years and years and years is you'll notice these capacitors are like a tube, and they're soaked in goop. Okay. Yeah, I'm not touching it. Oh, come on. Get some goop. Get, I don't, get some I don't goop. want any goop. goop. I, don't want, I don't want goop. 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 Well, the capacitors will dry out. This is, you can see, 0.5 capacitance, 0.5, so that's microfarads. Mm -hmm. And DCWV is direct current working voltage, which is 600. So this mm -hmm. is a half microfarad, 600 volt. Aerovox in New Bedford, Massachusetts. But a lot of times, this, this is probably like beeswax. Yeah, it looks like that wax. That it's soaked in. And they'll dry out. Mm. And if they dry out, they get wonky, because it's hot. You know, you've got all these yeah. vacuum tubes that make a lot of heat, and these will bake out over 20, 30 years. I mean, this, yeah. this thing here is probably twice as old as I am. It could go back to World War II easy. Um, and they'll die. Well, the cool thing is you can replace these pretty easily. Um, yeah. And then we've got some, some uh, transformers on the bottom. And you can see the bottom of all the tube sockets. And everything in here is hand soldered. I mean, it's, it's, look at the wire. I mean, even the wire is cool. This, this old wire is it's cloth insulated. Wow. Yeah, they don't they don't build it like that anymore, and I mean, it's common to find asbestos insulation in some of these things. And there's like this is I bet that's inductance, is it? No, it's the input decimals. Okay, these are like eight position rotary and rotary switches, and sometimes you'll see them set up for encoding where it's it's this really complicated matrix of stuff to make things work. It's really neat, um, but yeah, that's. That's point-to-point -point wiring, and it's cool. And this is, look, back in the days before zip ties, this is kind of cool. If you look down in here, see the, oh. the wires are all bundled together? Yeah. They did it with string. It's usually a waxed string. Um, and no idea what that is. That's, that's an inductor of some sort. It's a coil of wire mounted on a Kapton former. That it's just a coil of hair-thin wire. That's neat. But this is, this is made by hand. Like somebody had to sit and solder all these pieces together and it takes a lot of time. And it's just, it's neat. It's art. So, so what are these things? Those are just transformers. Oh, okay. Um, I have no idea what they do in here. I'm sure somebody watching this will. Um, oh, they're not transformers. I totally lied to you. See how there's two leads in, but there's no leads on the other side and there's no leads on the bottom. So these are just single coils. It tells us they're just inductors. They're used for filtering or something. I have no idea, but they're, well, they're probably the inductance for the tank circuit up on top, uh, which gives us our oscillator. But yeah, there's your equipment autopsy into a Hewlett Packard. Oh, what's the model? This is a 
Hewlett Packard Model 205 AG Alpha Gamma um, Audio Signal Generator. Made in Palo Alto, California. So yeah, it's cool. You guys have fun. And that's today's adventure here at the lab. I'm Chris Bowden. I'm Vicki. She's cool. Future girl. She's in the forums. So yeah, there's any other questions you want to know on us? I got goop on my finger. You got goop. It's very cool. Yeah. Ooh. Look, see, you got... No! That's a t-shirt. Ah! It's really old t-shirt. Yeah, it's old goop, too. Think of the cancer you could get from that. You could get, like, syphagana herpes from that. <laughs> it's not going to wash out its wax. <laughs> you guys have fun. We'll see you next time. We're going to get back to work. See ya.